Good morning. The Oversight Committee will come to order. Today we meet to consider a number of bills. House Resolution 665 for Excess Federal Buildings and Property Disposal Act of 2011. House Resolution 3071, the Presidential Records Act Amendments of 2011. House Resolution 3433, the Grant Reform and New Transparency Act of 2011. And H.R. 273, the Unfunded Mandate Information and Transparency Act. But before we consider these bills, I want to open uh, a colloquy with my friend from Maryland over the most important bill which we are not considering today. This committee has exclusive jurisdiction over the District of Columbia as its Authorization and Oversight Committee. We take that seriously. On a bipartisan basis, we have been working for a number of months to come up with a budget reform procedure that will allow the District of Columbia to enjoy effectively the autonomy that every other city in America enjoys. We had planned to mark up a bill here today, but after discussions with the ranking member, with the mayor, the head of city council, and individuals on, uh, on both sides, we find that there are still issues that need to be resolved in order to get a lasting way for the District of Columbia to control its own budget. As Chair, I remain committed that we will accomplish that. The District of Columbia has had reasonable autonomy for a long time in most areas. The clear exception has been in preparing well in advance to spend its own money. I will note today the presence of a great many young faces, some of them school age. Schools are the most important part of any city's budget, and the District of Columbia cannot make its plans independent of the appropriations process. To that end, we will attempt to find solutions for the limited amount of additional problems so that we can bring that bill to the floor at the next markup. Failing to do so will not mean that we will give up on the bill. We will continue to be dedicated to this piece of legislation until it becomes law. I now recognize the gentleman from Maryland for his comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me uh, start by be, uh, thanking you for proposing legislation that would substantially expand the ability of the District of Columbia to govern itself as envisioned by the D.C. Home Rule Act. This spring, the district government was pushed to the brink of shutdown because Congress was unable to finalize the Federal Government's own fiscal year 2011 spending measures. Additionally, the repeated adoption by Congress of temporary stopgap continuing resolutions has created serious challenges for the District of Columbia. No locality should be forced to operate under such uncertainty, which is why it is so critical for the District to be able to enact its own budget. I believe that the legislation is a result of a good faith effort to give the district the enhanced autonomy it so rightfully deserves over its own locally generated funds. I therefore deeply regret that I must oppose the proposed legislation in its current form. While the draft bill significantly reduces Federal interference in the District of Columbia's local budget making process, it adjusts the district's fiscal year so that it begins in July and ends on June, in June. The measure also permanently strips the authority of the district to make its own decisions about how to use its uh, own funds. Specifically, the proposed bill would permanently eliminate the ability of the district to use locally generated funds to pay for abortions for low-income women. I strongly oppose this language and I oppose this attempt to dictate to the city what it can and cannot do with its own funds. I understand that the Chairman may be concerned that the concept of budget autonomy in the Nation's capital might not make it out of the House without this provision, and indeed, he may be correct in that assumption. However, it is grossly unfair and indeed unnecessary to tie this controversial social rider to legislation that should be focused on expanding self-governance for the District and its residents. As Mayor Vincent Gray, City Council Chairman Kwame Brown, and the distinguished gentlelady of this committee, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, have already made clear, 
The anti-abortion provision amounts to a poison pill that does not reflect the will of the D.C. residents. As the duly elected leaders of the city, I defer to their judgment and support their opposition to the inclusion in this legislation of language that is not reflective of the will of the residents of the District of Columbia. It is my sincere hope that the majority will continue working with Delegate Norton, Mayor Gray, and Chairman Brown to produce legislation that provides the budget autonomy the city has long sought and deserves after a decade of prudent financial management and leadership. Please know that I and my staff stand ready, willing, and able to work with you, Mr. Chairman, Congresswoman Norton, and the city to draft such legislation. That said, I would like to yield the remainder of my time to Congresswoman Norton. Well, I, I thank the ranking member for yielding to me, uh, and I certainly want to thank uh, the chairman of this committee, Chairman Issa, not only for the bill that uh, he produced, but particularly for the process uh, by which he uh, came to his bill. This, the bill uh, came um, during a hearing uh, that was called a rare hearing uh, for this committee uh, on the City's budget, rare because the budget hearing, of course, uh, usually takes place in the Appropriation Committee, but of course the authorizers uh, have jurisdiction uh, to discuss uh, and act on certain bu budget issues as well. Uh, the chairman uh, listened to the witnesses, the minority and the majority of witnesses, uh, and uh, I think that he, along with many members, uh, were interested in that testimony. The testimony essentially uh, said that at a time when many state and local budgets and finances are in disarray, the district's budget seemed outstanding compared uh, to many of those. Uh, and the witnesses testified that uh, the inefficiencies tended to come because of the dual process, that the, the budget had to come to the Congress, that the district paid a premium in Wall Street because of this dual process. Uh, that um, many inefficiencies flowed back to the uh, local government because of this process. The chairman uh, then said that he thought he would like to work with the city on a bill to give the district greater budget autonomy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you not only for that declaration, but for the discussions that ensued uh, uh, thereafter about how to make the Chairman's ideas essentially operational within the context of the way the local government operates. Uh, I want to say, Mr. Chairman, uh, that your proposal uh, came close to my own budget autonomy bill, uh, bearing in mind, as you must, the prerogatives of the House. Local funds uh, would have uh, become effective in a new fiscal year, the same fiscal year that every member of this House recognizes uh, July 1st. It would have enabled us, therefore, to deal with our schools in a, an extraordinarily different way. Uh, we would never have been faced with, with a shutdown. Uh, the, the bill was uh, extraordinary in its scope and in it, its deference and understanding of the City, taking into account, uh, as the Chairman had to, what the, the House would require. Uh, so while it wasn't exactly my bill, it came so close that I, I want to say, say to you, Mr. Chairman, that the Mayor, the City Council Chair, and I uh, believe that the first thing we had to do was to look closely at this bill. And then there were some in the press that said well, we were surprised that they didn't come forward and quickly say that because of a bill, of a part of the bill that they knew we opposed, that, that, that we didn't want to talk about this bill. On the contrary, when a chairman uh, of either party listens to the District of Columbia the way uh, uh, Chairman Issa listened to his own witnesses and to the, the witnesses from the city, comes forward with a plan, even if that plan is not your perfect plan, the very least it seemed to us that we owed uh, the chairman of this committee was to seriously do our due diligence to look at this proposal. And I am glad we did. 
because when we looked at the proposal ourselves, when we, we, we combed it uh, as thoroughly as we could, uh, bearing in mind that this uh, markup would occur uh, today, uh, the deeper we went, the, the better we liked the proposal. Um, the permanent rider was, of course, uh, anathema to us, not only because it involved our most vulnerable citizens, our low-income women, uh, but because it would be the first permanent rider in the history uh, of uh, home rule. We were quite aware that this was not an idea uh, that the chairman authored, and uh, we were understanding of his practical sense in wanting to get the bill done. We believed uh, as well, however, that there would be others, perhaps I regret to say, some in this committee who might believe that they ought to also offer riders should the bill move forward at this time. So after a great deal of, of discussion among the three uh, leaders uh, in the city, we decided that uh, we could not accept the bill at this time, but we had to do all we could to make our own constituents and to make the chairman understand that he had taken a mighty leap forward toward exactly what the city has been trying to achieve ever since the Home Rule Act was, was passed. I had some conversations with the chairman yesterday and indicated to him, uh, as we did in our statement, that this was such an important step. Uh, were it to be made by a member of either party, that I certainly hope that we would continue this conversation in the spirit in which he has started. And, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think that uh, what uh, this process has um, told, uh, has told, it seems to me, the public and us, is that it was something of a civic lesson in how the committees operate at their best. Uh, ideas thrown out here, the other side was, is not sure where they want to go in, on, on, on that idea. Then it, it concretizes, and after that, uh, there are discussions and and decisions, and nobody goes away mad. In fact, I want to say to you, Mr. Chairman, that we went away very glad and very happy that you had made a, what we regarded as a historic step forward for uh, independence, for the budget of the District of Columbia, the local budget raised by the citizens of the District of Columbia. And again, I want to thank you on behalf not only of myself as a member of this committee, uh, but the City Administration, uh, the City Council, and, uh, and very much on behalf of the residents of the District of Columbia. I thank the gentlelady. And if I can just uh, close by, by saying, you know, on most elements, I have a ranking member who I look to. But on the District of Columbia, I have two ranking members to look to. And uh, it, in closing, it became apparent, as you uh, said and alluded to, both directly and indirectly, there were lots of other potential riders. I believe we could have gotten past the Hyde Amendment uh, in a way that would have been mutually uh, beneficial. But the lack of knowing all the other riders puts us in an unusual position that going forward with a markup and trying to fix at that time could have been uh, a fool's uh, journey. So I am on record today that if people have riders on either side, within this committee or within other committees, uh, that we look forward to seeing those, hearing those, including them in the bill, and then pre-conferencing a way to make sure that they are not overly onerous to the district. And we will go forward based on the assumption that all parties have had an opportunity to weigh in on what they believe they have some right to dictate to the city. Uh, but my intention is to make sure that once we agree within this committee, the Committee of Jurisdiction, uh, that we not be, uh, and I don't want to say bushwhack because that would be a bad word, but surprised uh, unfairly. And I am reaching out to all the chairmen. I know that you will be reaching out to the ranking members to make sure that if they have got something, let us know about it. I don't want to have some hypothetical that comes up on the House floor. Uh, and therefore, uh, the next markup will probably be nearly exclusively on this bill. If it is not in December, then I will tell you we will have subsequent hearings to vet all of these, because I will keep the light on this issue until we have a law. And I thank all of you for your comments. At this time, uh,
the committee will now consider house resolution six six five the excess federal building and property disposal act of two thousand and eleven without objection i discharge the subcommittee on government organization efficiency and financial management from considering further h r six six five the chair will now open the bill house resolution six six five for consideration without objection h r six six five will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point the text has already been distributed and is in each of your folders. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 665, a bill to establish a pilot program for the expedited disposal of Federal real property. I recognize myself for a short opening statement. First of all, the Federal Government currently holds more than 10,000 excess properties and spends hundreds of millions of dollars annually maintaining that property. Congressional research uh, by any other measure, the Federal Government has over 45,000 uh, properties that the Government Accountability Office reports are underutilized. This bill is bipartisan, well-reasoned, well-vetted, and has, in fact, the support of the Chair and the Ranking Member. We intend to ensure that our jurisdiction over this type of disposal or over property disposal be maintained and to ensure that the executive branch begins the process in earnest of being able to uh, liquidate this property with a GAO estimate to save the taxpayers over $1.5 billion per year. Regrettably, current law does not provide an incentive for agencies to dispose of unneeded assets. In May, the President announced a plan to reduce the number of surplus government properties through a BRAC-like commission. While the President's goals are commendable, we are concerned that that approach uh, that he has proposed would be costly. At my request earlier this year, the Congressional Budget uh, Office reviewed President Obama's proposal. In July, the CBO testified before this committee regarding the President's proposal and stated that the President's pr proposal would increase direct spending over 10 years, while also increasing discretionary spending by as much as $420 million over the next five years. Making sure the American people get to the President's goal at the earliest possible time and to ensure that we use space as efficiently and inexpensively as possible, uh, I am pleased to support a bill that Mr. Chaffetz and Mr. Quigley, both members of the committee, have worked on together, worked out many details, and reached a consensus that I believe the entire committee will favorably report today. This is not to diminish the need for the support of the administration. Without President Obama's willingness to take up an issue, to admit at an executive level that there are vast amounts of excess and underused property, we would not be in a position today to move this bill. So I want to thank all those involved, including my ranking member, for the support of this process, urge support of this, uh, this bill, and yield to the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for considering this important legislation on Federal real property disposal. Through the years, our committee has led the effort to address the deficiencies that currently exist in real property management, and we have worked to find bipartisan solutions to these very difficult issues. Today, I believe that we have found a bipartisan solution in the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 665. I will uh, therefore rest my comments uh, and yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I will hold open the record until the end of the day for any member who would like to make written statements. Uh, Mr. Qu I now recognize Mr. Mr. Quigley, to, uh, I understand you have an amendment in the form of a substitute? Yes, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized to offer his amendment. Uh, there is an amendment at the desk in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 665, offered by Mr. Quigley of Illinois. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and original text for the purpose of, of amendment. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for moving this bill forward and your cooperative efforts to, uh, in a bipartisan nature to accomplish this goal. I also want to sincerely thank Mr. Chavitz for uh, his extraordinary work on this measure to craft a bipartisan amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, and finally, I want to give special thanks to Ranking Member Cummings for working with me and my staff 
on this Federal Property Disposal Bill and serving as a co-sponsor. Uh, there could not be a better time to move a measure like this one through the Congress. We are facing an unsustainable budget deficit and must get our fiscal house in order. One of the best ways to achieve much needed reductions is spending and spending is to create efficiencies and cut waste. That is exactly what this bipartisan measure accomplishes. The Federal Government is the largest property owner in the world with an inventory of over 900,000 buildings and structures and 41 million acres of land. Yet we waste billions of dollars each year maintaining properties we no longer need. The Federal Government currently maintains 14,000 buildings and structures deemed excess and over 76,000 properties identified as underutilized. In fiscal year 2009, these underutilized buildings cost us $1.7 billion to operate annually, and we spend hundreds of millions more on buildings we simply don't need. The GAO has continuously found that many properties are no longer relevant to their agency's missions and that agencies could do a better job of identifying and disposing of unneeded properties. So why are we paying billions to sit on thousands of unneeded properties? All these problems are addressed by this amendment. The amendment addresses three major hurdles to disposing of thousands of unneeded Federal properties and generate much needed revenue. First, administrative burdens. Agencies are often deterred from disposing of unneeded property due to a variety of screening processes which can take up to two years and cost millions in maintenance during the process. This amendment puts in place a five-year pilot program that lifts these hurdles to disposal and asks the GAO, the GSA, to expeditiously, expeditiously dispose of 15 high-value unneeded properties. Importantly, this pilot also, also sets aside 2 percent of the proceeds from the sale of these properties for homeless assistance grants. Second, budgetary disincentives. Currently, agencies avoid disposing of excess property because of high upfront cost of disposal. Yes. Paying for environmental cleanup can cost millions. This amendment would allow all agencies to retain the proceeds from the disposition of property and use those funds as authorized by Congress to maintain, repair, and dispose of other excess properties. Any funds not used to prepare and dispose of property would be paid back to the Treasury for debt reduction. The third and final obstacle is the lack of transparency and oversight of Federal property. All Federal property information is currently maintained in an extensive database managed by GSA. But this information is not available to the public, the Federal workers, or most Congressional staff. Our amendment would require GSA to submit an annual report to Congress that includes information on the number, value, and maintenance costs of all Federal properties. This information would also be made available to the public at no cost in an online database. The transparency the amendment will provide is absolutely imperative because, as things stand today, we are flying blind. Let me give you one example. When I learned about all these valuable excess properties, my staff decided to go take a look at a few of them in my home state of Illinois. We visited a property that was reportedly worth over $8 million and cost more than $80,000 per year to maintain. The USDA database said the property was in excellent condition, but the reality was quite different. The $8 million storage facility was in shambles, complete with peeling paint and deteriorated siding the exterior overtaken by vegetation and the interior looted by vandals. So it was with scores of other buildings on the site. What the USDA spreadsheet represented as an excellent shape and receiving thousands annually in maintenance was, in fact, a dilapidated mess. The USDA explained that a formula was used to arrive at the estimates for annual maintenance costs and replacement value, but that the numbers had no relation to reality. Clearly, there is a serious disconnect between what is on our books and the reality on the ground. We can't possibly know what our assets are worth or make a plan to capitalize on them without accurate data. Without better, more transparent data, we are flying by, blind. I thank the Chair and my colleagues again for their work on this important issue. I urge my colleagues to support this bipartisan amendment and pass H.R. 665. <clears throat> thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, and the co-author of the bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, you and, and your work and dedication on this issue. I also appreciate the ranking member and his uh, working together in a bipartisan way. I particularly want to thank Mr. Quigley, who has uh, taken a keen interest and done a great deal of work in this. I am recommending to, to the committee that we uh, accept his amendment as it is offered. I think it improves the bill. It will truly uh, uh, move us in the, in the right direction. 
I would also like to remind my colleagues that the Federal Government is the largest single holder of real property in the United States with more than 900,000 buildings and structures. And the GAO estimates that the Federal Government holds some 45,000 underutilized properties that cost nearly $1.7 billion annually to operate. Most recently, back in June of this year, the OMB Comptroller Daniel Werfel testified before a Senate, testified before a Senate subcommittee that the government controls even more with 14,000 uh, excess buildings and structures and 76,000 underutilized properties. The Federal Government has accumulated excess properties because the disposal process is in many ways flawed. In fact, in, in 2003 and in 2011, the GAO designated Federal Real Property Management as a high-risk area for the Federal Government. This bill, H.R. 665, the Excess Federal Building and Property Disposal Act, would streamline the disposal of high-value properties while also overhauling the existing disposal process. The bill creates this pilot program that would expedite the disposal of 15 properties and maximize profit. Ninety-eight percent of the proceeds under the pilot would be directed to the U.S. Treasury General Fund. Other two percent would be used to fund a grant program for the homeless. The bill would also overhaul the current disposal process by reducing administrative overhead, creating new agency incentives, and requiring greater transparency and accountability from the property disposal apparatus. The bill is bipartisan. It generates revenue. It reduces operational budget maintenance, addresses the concern of third parties, such as the homeless. And I would urge my colleagues to vote in, in favor of this. And again, I thank my colleague, Mr. Quigley, for offering this uh, amendment in the nature of substitute and recommend that we, uh, that we adopt it. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia seek recognition? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the uh, amendment in the nature of substitute. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 65 offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to speak on it quickly before the amendment. Right. Would the, would the, would the gentleman withdraw? Of course. Uh, the gentleman is recognized very right. briefly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the Federal Government has costly and pressing problems disposing of its uh, unneeded real property, which includes its public buildings and lands. As a result, the GAO has placed this issue on in this high risk list. Unneeded and underutilized buildings are languishing in the uh, Federal inventory when their sale uh, could generate much needed revenue for the National Treasury. The maintenance of these buildings costs the government nearly $1.7 billion uh, in fiscal year 2010 alone. In tough times like those we face today, this waste is simply un unacceptable. In this Congress, four separate pieces of legislation have been introduced to help solve the problem. This amendment combines the best elements of these legislative proposals and creates a timely and workable method of disposing of excess Federal property while generating the highest possible financial returns. The amendment would establish a five-year pilot program to dispose of the 15, high, 15 highest value unneeded Federal real properties. The Federal Government will clearly gain from the disposal of these properties. Not only uh, will a fair market value generate income, but we will realize significant savings by eliminating uh, maintenance and operating costs. I also support this amendment because it will provide uh, aid to organizations dedicated to helping the most vulnerable among us, the homeless. Um, the legislation requires that 2 percent of the proceeds from the sale of these properties will be used to fund grants to eligible organizations that serve the homeless. Uh, the requirement preserves our commitment to the goals of the McKinney-Vento Homeless and Assistance Act. And I will submit the rest of uh, my statement for the record. I thank the gentleman. If there are no other requests for time, the gentleman from Virginia is recognized to offer an amendment. I thank the Chair, and I offer this amendment on behalf of myself. The clerk myself. will read the amendment again. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 665 offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. I thank the Chair. I offer this amendment on behalf of myself and Mr. Quigley. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you may recall that when we actually dealt earlier uh, with this uh, matter, you and I both shared a concern that there could be one unintended consequence, which was to preclude State and local governments from fairly bidding on excess property when there could be a good public use. And the, you may recall, Mr. Chairman, your predecessor and mine helped negotiate a, a, a great deal uh, uh, with the former Federal Lorton Prison in Lorton, uh, Fairfax, Virginia. And that is a great example of how a local government partnering with the Federal Government was able to take advantage of what was then excess property, 
Uh, we were able, to, uh, the Federal Government benefited by not having to incur the maintenance costs on a recurring basis for preserving over 300 buildings on that 2,500-acre site. Part of the site was allowed to be developed. The rest of it was preserved uh, as a recreational space or uh, actually as a, a museum and an art center uh, for public purposes. And it was a great boon, uh, frankly, to my community and allowed enormous economic expansion around the site by taking away the stigma of the prison while the site itself, the 2,000 acres, were preserved and not developed. And so I just wanted to make sure uh, that uh, we didn't preclude that unintentionally. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the majority staff's cooperation in working out language uh, that I think is acceptable to both sides. I think it takes care of the concern, and I urge my colleagues to support the amendment, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Utah is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate the concerns addressed by, by Mr. Conley. I think he has uh, pointed out something that would be appropriate. I would urge uh, support from this committee. Uh, for this amendment. I do think it improves it, and uh, I appreciate his, uh, his support of this, and I, I support his amendment. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Does any other member wish to speak on the amendment? The gentlelady from the district. Oh, on the bill. Okay. Well, we will do this amendment then. Uh, as no further members are seeking recognition, the question is, on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Connolly, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. In the opinion of the chair, is the eye, chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Are there any further amendments? Does anyone else want to strike the last word on the bill? The gentlelady from the District of Columbia is recognized for five minutes. Um, Mr. Chairman, I am ranking member of uh, a, uh, another committee which has been considering a similar proposal, and I want to indicate why I support this proposal. Um, uh, you have dealt with uh, uh, the, the proposal before us, uh, much like the President's proposal, uh, would have involved what we call the civilian BRAC. That gets you into another, uh, it, it's a very good kind of model because it is the, the BRAC that we all know, but that is another mechanism that you would have to set up, you run into scoring problems. And um, that bill has not moved. I've been thinking for a long time, why don't we just use the existing mechanisms? This committee does have jurisdictions over sur surplus property already. Uh, this bill and the manager's amendment uh, <coughs> would have uh, the GSA, which is the expert agency, and the OMB together uh, to, to, to take on this accumulating problem. And you have got an incentive in the bill, 20 percent for the agencies who are holding on to the property. They get some of the proceeds from the property. You have dealt with the homeless, uh, which our bill did not. And that made it, uh, um, that, that, that made it quite flawed as far as, uh, as we were concerned. I like the fact that this bill uh, does not create a new bureaucracy, latches on to what the problem is does it in a, in a pilot way so that I take it, Mr. Chairman, that would mean that we wouldn't have fire sales of properties, that you would, we would look at the property to see if this is a good time to sell the property, uh, to see if there was any other government use for the property so we wouldn't sell the property, then go out and now have to lease property. Uh, and the pilot notion, it seems to me, does take that into account. So I think it is a very intelligent way to handle the property. Would the gentlelady yield? I uh, would be happy to yield. Uh, first of all, that is, the, I think, the uh, brilliance of this bill is that it uh, it preserves the do some good disposal, come back and report and look at it. Uh, additionally, as to the other legislation that I know uh, your other committee has marked up, we were prepared to mark it up here today. The parties felt that with the likely changes that would occur here, they would rather negotiate further. Uh, to try to have bipartisan amendments, and we have uh, offered them time to do so. So it is still the intention for us as a sequential referral uh, to mark up that bill when the parties have reached uh, a bipartisan uh, agreement that could create competing bills. We have no, no problem with good competition here. But this bill was ripe. It was well supported, and we believe in its current form as it leaves this committee, it is prepared to become law. So that is why it is here today. Well, uh, if I could reclaim my time for just another minute, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I look, when, when, when one considers legislation, and I know 
in our prior discussion, you had to think about this as well, one has to consider what to get through both houses, if you are serious about legislating. Uh, this approach, which does not create a new mechanism, which is going to be a source of, that is going to be a source of controversy itself, not because anybody is against it, but because anything that looks like you are setting up another bureaucracy and costing more money, uh, even if it is not a lot more money, it is going to be a problem. Uh, I think this, this approach is more likely uh, to pass both houses. And if we are serious about disposing of property, I believe that, that the, the, the Senate is, is working on a combed down uh, approach that uh, looks not unlike the approach you have adopted. If the gentlelady would further yield. Glad to. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, this is one of the odd situations in which the President's initial offering of a BRAC type process, which is similar to a commission, would seem to favor the other bill. But I believe the bill that we have before us today uh, keeps the essence of the President's uh, proposal and then does it within an existing system we believe has the shortest distance to success, yielding back. Agreed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, if there is no further discussion, the question is on the amendment in nature of a substitute as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I now move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 665 to the House with the rec recommendation that it do pass as amended. <clears throat> the question is on favorably reporting H.R. 665 to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes, the ayes have it. The, uh, the, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. H.R. 665 is ordered reported to the House. And next book. The committee, the committee will now consider House Resolution 3071, the Presidential Records Act amendments, uh, <clears throat> amendments of 2011. Without objection, I discharge the subcommittee on health care, District of Columbia, Census, and National Archives from further consideration of House Resolution 3071. We will now open the bill, House Resolution 3071, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. 3071 is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed to each of you in your folders, and the clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 3071, a bill to amend chapter, title, uh, chapter 22 of Title 44, United States Code, popularly known as the Presidential Records Act, to establish procedures for the consideration of claims of constitutionally based privilege against disclosure of presidential records. I recognize myself for the purpose of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute, and I ask the clerk to distribute the amendment. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and as the original text for purposes of amendment. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. The amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporates the full text of H.R. 3071. The bill was introduced by Mr. Towns in September and codifies the existing executive order that allows former presidents to appeal uh, to a incumbent presidents to keep certain presidential documents privileged under the Presidential Record Act. This puts into statute a process instituted by President Reagan in 1989, restored by President Obama in 2009, and used without controversy by four of the last five Presidents. It thus fills procedural gaps in the Presidential Record Act, which does not provide a way for former Presidents to ask for an extension of privilege for, the, for previously held documents. Many on this committee, myself included, want to always have the maximum level of transparency. But as we know, Presidents of one party to another often see the wisdom in an extension for a period of time, particularly when those documents would be so redacted as to be useless or it is appropriate to retain some level of cumulative secret for the benefit of the current administration. There is no evidence that this privilege has ever been wrongfully used or that the eventual discovery does not occur. It does allow Federal agencies to turn over records to the National Archives on a regular basis without sacrificing legal custody for the documents. This means 
They need not self-store the documents for 30 years, the process which almost guarantees some information will be lost and a great excess cost will be borne. It eliminates the so-called print-to-file rule, which actually encourages agencies to print out their electronic files and send paper to the National Archives. As all of us know, we are not a paperless society, but we certainly do not want to be a paper-producing government. Ultimately, we want to have all of the Presidential records in electronic files and available through redundant storage to be never lost or damaged, whether by fire, flood, or any other occurrence. Good government demands good record keeping, and it is important that we update our laws to the realities of the email era and the Internet. The Chair now recognizes the Ranking Member to make his opening statement on this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for agreeing to, to move uh, this legislation. I note that in the 1100th Congress, um, 111th Congress, uh, Mr. Towns, who was then the chairman of this committee, introduced this legislation, and it passed the House by an overwhelming margin of 359 to 58. During this Congress, I have joined Mr. Towns and every Democratic member of the committee in reintroducing this legislation because we all believe that we need to improve transparency of Presidential records. And so, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for keeping your commitment to moving to these bills today. I really do appreciate that. Um, as to the amendment, I support this amendment. I appreciate the bipartisan manner in which our staffs have worked together on this legislation, as well as the effort your staff put forth in crafting this amendment. This amendment incorporates the language of the, the Electronic Message Preservation Act. That legislation is part of the Transparency and Open Government Act that I, along with every Democratic member of this committee, introduced in March. The Electronic Message Preservation Act will ensure that White House and agency email records will be preserved. Currently, agencies are not uh, required to preserve emails electronically. In fact, some agencies literally print out emails and store them in boxes. Under this amendment, Federal agencies and the White House will be required to adopt and maintain modern records management and retention policies. With the additions made by this amendment, the underlying bill will be an even more powerful tool to expand transparency at all levels of our government. I urge the adoption of this uh, amendment in nature and substitute, and yield back the balance of my time. The Chair now recognizes the author of the bill, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. I support H.R. 3071, the Presidential and Federal Records Act Amendment of 2011, and the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Chairman Issa. Let me uh, thank you, Chairman Issa, for your assistance and for the assistance of his staff with the language of this bill. We have shared a strong bipartisan appreciation for the importance of this bill over the course of many Congresses. And I appreciate your cooperation helping to move this bill forward. The Presidential Records Act established the records of a president belong to the people and not to the president. This bill will ensure that the public has access to presidential records in a timely manner. It will also allow historians to tell a complete story about presidential administrations. The bill sets strict deadlines for the president and former presidents to review records before they are released to the public. The bill also makes clear that only presidents and former presidents can assert privilege over presidential records. This means that the right to assert executive privilege is personal to current and former presidents and cannot be bequeathed to assistants, relatives, or descendants. As public servants, it is important that we, that we maintain our roles as stewards of our Nation's great history. The records of a President paint an important picture of an administration, as well as the time that surround it. Most importantly, these records belong to the people, and this bill ensures clarity in that fact. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time and look forward to this moving forward. The gentleman yields back. Does any other member wish to speak on this bill? Does any other member wish to offer an amendment? If there is no further discussion, the question— Mr. Chair. Uh, the gentleman from North Carolina 
uh, seeks amend? recognition for what purpose? We're, we're dealing with H.R. 30. Uh, President's Records Act, yes. Yes, thank you. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3021 offered by Mr. McHenry of North Carolina. I ask unanimous consent to be considered as read and recognize the gentleman from North Carolina for five minutes to explain his amendment as it is being distributed. Uh, this is a very simple amendment to uh, improve the legislation. Uh, this amendment is uh, putting an end to the all too common practice of the Executive Office of the President employees using personal email, instant messaging, and other similar accounts to engage in official Federal business. Uh, this, I think, is an important addition to this legislation. Uh, when the Presidential Records Act became law in 1978, uh, it was to ensure all Presidential documents are captured, stored, and reviewed uh, by the National Archives with an eye towards preservation. Um, I think this is a very important thing, regardless of the administration. Uh, I think it is important that we do this now, um, and this would uh, codify uh, uh, one of the great concerns um, uh, that, that has been raised uh, on a bipartisan basis. Uh, Democrats raise it when there is a Republican in the White House. Republicans raise it when there is a Democrat in the White House. Um, but the fact is we have got to do this and, uh, in, in a bipartisan way, I would hope, um, so that we can avoid um, uh, uh, the, the potential loophole, or actually the loophole, uh, that allows uh, folks to avoid creating a record of communication via their official account. Uh, there have been a, a number of uh, uh, there have been press reports that uh, that uh, this White House um, is using uh, non-official uh, email and uh, digital communication. Um, there, uh, obviously, in the last. Uh, uh, in the last uh, administration, there was uh, many on the, this committee that, that uh, raised a concern uh, that there was a avoidance of making a, uh, you know, an official email uh, public uh, by using uh, other accounts. Um, so this is a very simple amendment. I ask uh, support from my colleagues, and I hope that we can do this on a bipartisan basis and with the gentleman with a good yield. bill. I would be happy to yield to the chairman. Uh, just one question. As I read the amendment, uh, although it makes it unlawful to, to, to use nonofficial means, uh, there is no penalty here. So this is a, uh, if I understand correctly, a prohibition, but without a uh, specific sanction attached to it. That is right. That is right. There is no amendment. Uh, there, is, there, there are no penalties within the Presidential Records Act. I appreciate that. Yield back. Get and yield further. Be happy to yield to the former chairman. I have, um, first of all, I have some questions about this uh, as well. Uh, let me say that I support the overall goal of clarity for executive branch employees. But since we just got this amendment, uh, you know, uh, I have some concerns. You know, when you just get something, I'd like to be able to look at it a little further and study it and see in terms of. Um, uh, what we really, really doing here? For example, I'm trying to understand how this amendment applies to communications covered by both the Presidential Records Act and the Hatch Act. And let me give you an example. Suppose the President, let's use President George Bush, wanted to give a speech at a conference to an evangelical leaders organized by his campaign. Follow this. As you know, he established the Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives in the White House. What if the President asked the head of this office to review his speech for accuracy in terms of what that office accomplished? Under this amendment, as I understand it, should that official use his government email account to do that or would he have to use an outside email account? This is not clear to me. Under the Hatch Act, there is a question about whether he should use his official account because the conference is sponsored by the campaign. Follow this. But under this amendment, as I read it, but this the head of the faith-based office 
can't use an outside email account either. What happens in a situation like this? How would your amendment handle this? Let me say that, you know, I really want to work with you, but I would hope that you would consider withdrawing this until we have an opportunity to look at it just a little further. I want to go where you want to go, I do believe, but I, I, I have some questions about this amendment. Well, uh, I, I thank the gentleman. And um, uh, this, uh, our staff presented it to the minority staff uh, yesterday. Um, and uh, I think you should use the word last night. I am not a staffer on the majority side, well, so I don't know. It also had know late last night. I, what time was it? I would ask that? unanimous consent there be additional two minutes for this colloquy. Sure. So uh, I, I, thank, I thank my colleague and I thank the chairman. Um, what, what, this, is, this is constructed in such a way that the uh, Obama White House could keep their political account. That is not a personal account. There has been uh, a history created from the Clinton White House through the Bush White House and now to the Obama White House on the protocols and the proper uh, channels for individuals within the executive branch that are doing that political scheduling that you are discussing. That has been established. We actually have nearly two decades of establishment of that process and it is a limited number of folks within the executive branch. What this is a very narrowly constructed to prevent is for somebody to use their Gmail account in order to schedule uh, perhaps political meetings or something they don't want uh, to be uh, part of the, the, their official email exchange that, you, that is uh, very readily uh, accessible through uh, uh, normal protocols under law. Uh, so I would be happy to yield to the gentleman uh, if he has additional questions. Yeah. Uh, will you, will, actually, will you object to just uh, looking at the basic uh, situation here and, and, and get an expert to sort of talk to us about it before we move forward? I mean, I don't see in terms of, you know, what the rush here on this is. Well, I, I certainly appreciate I mean, I, it in reclaiming my time. I, I, would, uh, I would, you know, since we did give uh, a heads up about this. There was awareness on the minority side in order to vet this. If, if you have a uh, perfecting amendment, we would be happy to look at it. But uh, we, we did present this uh, to the gentleman uh, on the day of Wednesday, um, uh, before apparently before the close of business. I am not exactly sure. That, that's which, Thursday. With, with that's the Thursday. Staff, how the extended work, time yeah. of the gentleman has expired. The, the, chair now, the, chair now re the Chair now recognizes the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and to the sponsor of the amendment. I, you uh, were very kind in the, the words you used to say that you wanted a bipartisan effort, and, and, I, and I, we all do. Um, I think that you raised some legitimate concerns through this amendment. But at the same time, Mr. Challenge makes some good, uh, you know, uh, suggestions as to maybe we need to hold up on this. Um, for example, the amendment prohibits some White House employees from using non-official electronic messaging accounts, programs, or systems to communicate for official purposes. It is unclear, uh, Mr. Sponsor, the amendment, how this would impact the ability of White House employees to, uh, to post official electronic messages on non-official systems such as Twitter and Facebook. Uh, as technology and, and, and our use of it evolves, I am sure that we all want to ensure that the White House is able to use the latest technology systems to communicate its official messages. Additionally, this amendment uses some terms that are not defined in the PRA, such as, quote, communicate for official purposes, end of quote. Mr. Chairman, can you explain what this phrase is intended to mean? I'm, and I am intending this uh, question to the sponsor of the amendment. Is it intended to encompass those communications that would be considered presidential records under the PRA, or is it meant to refer to some other types of communications? And, and, and by the way, I, I'm, I'm, I look forward to your answer, but these are the kinds of things that I think we need to see if we can work out. I mean, and, and this, I know Mr. Towns and I'm sure everybody on this side, sincerely want to work this out in a way where it makes sense, but we also, at the same time, 
don't want to create even more confusion. But I will yield so the gentleman might answer the question. Uh, well, I, I certainly appreciate that. The, the, uh, the, the President's Twitter account, the uh, Press Secretary's Twitter account, those are official accounts um, that go or, with the White House. Um, so this amendment is crafted in such a way that that is permissible. Now, what, is, what would not be permissible is for an individual to use a Gmail account or a Yahoo account or whatever uh, uh, different type of uh, uh, forum that they, they use for their personal email account. They would not be able to use that in order to transact uh, business. I mean, it, it's a very simple prohibition. This is not uh, uh, very complex. And, and to be honest about it, on this committee, we've had in my uh, seven years on this committee, we have discussed it every year uh, I have been here. This is not um, a new issue. In fact, uh, Chairman Waxman raised this issue uh, uh, in, in, during the Bush administration. Um, and the, the fact is, under the Bush administration, you are not permitted to use a personal email account uh, from a computer in the White House. They, they had a, a firewall preventing that. Um, and so I, I was aware, because I was friends with a number of staffers um, uh, uh, during that administration, and, uh, and uh, you know, they thought that that was difficult for them because uh, they couldn't email somebody to go to lunch sitting at their desk. But unfortunately, with working in the Executive Office of the President, there are additional, uh, there's additional scrutiny, as we all know, and they had to comply with it. Well. You confused me even more. Yeah. Um, and I am not trying to be smart. No, that wasn't, it wasn't intended. I, I, know, I know that. But that is why I think we need to work all of this out. Mr. Chairman, I, I would appreciate it if, if we could try to. Uh, I yeah, will yield to the yeah. gentleman. You know, I just think that really, based on your explanation, I think you made a case that we should wait. I really do. If I wish I could have recorded everything you said so you could have heard it. So I think you would then agree with me that we need to wait. And, uh, and, I, and I think we should. I mean, I, I, I think that there are some things that are going on here uh, that um, uh, we are sort of ignoring. And I think that we should spend a little time talking with some experts before we move forward with this. And I hope you would consider it. And I have a lot of re respect and admiration for the gentleman. And I hope that he would uh, uh, consider doing that. And let's see if we can continue to work on it. And I want to work with you on it. And I hope you would agree to that. Um, well, the will the gentleman yield? Go ahead. Uh, it is my time. I will yield to the chairman. Sure. Go right ahead. Uh, what I am going to suggest here is uh, I, I suspect that when this, this particular amendment comes up for a vote, there will be a request for a recorded vote. If during the intervening time before we conclude today there can be some sort of an agreement on an amendment to that amendment, I certainly would hold the bill open. We would, we would do it. If not, then I would ask the uh, former chairman uh, if he would want to have his uh, bill moved to the next markup, which we expect to have in about two weeks. Uh, we will have a markup in December. But that would be your, your decision, and, and maybe it would be a good one. If I would uh, ask unanimous consent for an additional minute, uh, and if the gentleman would continue uh, yielding. Uh, I believe that this committee is dedicated, and I know that the, uh, the author of the bill is dedicated, that we have seen, and I am going to use the word abuse in the loosest sense of the word, I am not intending to disparage, but inconsistencies under both the Bush administration, the Chairman Waxman and Chairman Towns, and under uh, the Obama administration, uh, where the rules are not clear. And that lack of clarity as to what an iPad in the White House is or what a RNC account is and how it can or can't be used, in spite of the Bush administration and the Obama administration having guidelines. So I do think this is, an, this is a worthwhile amendment to seek. But I also think that uh, Mr. Towns is correct that we want to get it right. We don't want to have that. So if we can go through that sort of a procedure, the amendment will be pending a vote. I am hoping that staff can get to it. I, I have my doubts. But then ultimately, I think it would be the minority's or the author's decision of whether or not to move it two weeks and see if we can't work on it. I would like to move it today, and that's why I suggest this. Now, I, and Mr. Chairman, um, first of all, thank you. Um, I have a, 
an amendment that perhaps staff can, second degree amendment that staff can try to work on while we are, uh, you know, going on to some other business? I, I mean, is that? I, I think certainly we certainly can. Right, well, you can offer your second degree amendment right now. I okay. recognize. Well, okay. All right. I ask unanimous consent that it be um, considered as read. The clerk will read the amendment. And now it is unanimous consent to be considered as read. Amendment offered by Mr. Cummings of Maryland to the, the amendment is offered by Mr. McInerney. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the second degree amendment that I am proposing would create an exception to the prohibition in Mr. McHenry's amendment against the use of nonofficial email accounts to allow the use of those accounts in instances when official email accounts are inaccessible. It would also clarify that the prohibition applies to the creation or sending of presidential records a type of record that is specifically defined within the PRA. Many uh, White House employees and certainly the President and Vice President have demanding jobs that require them to constantly, uh, constantly uh, to, be access to, to, to be constantly accessible to perform their official duties. Uh, in those instances when they do not have access to an official White House device, it would be appropriate to, them, to permit them to use an unofficial device or account. Additionally, the White House has experienced uh, outages in email service. It doesn't make sense for the White House to have to close for business just because the server is down. That said, I note that under the Presidential Records Act, any presidential record created in such a circumstance would still have to be preserved. My amendment also substitutes the term, quote, presidential records for the term, quote, communicate for unofficial uh, purposes, end of quote, used in Mr. McHenry's amendment. The term presidential records is defined in the PRA and therefore provides clear and specific guidance regarding what kinds of records are prohibited from being sent from an unofficial email account. Uh, while both of these changes would improve the underlying amendment, there are still a number of questions that need to be answered uh, before we adopt any provision with such potentially far-reaching consequences as the McHenry Amendment, and I would ask the Chairman to continue to work with us on the critical issue, but I will submit that amendment at this time. That I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. I would like to speak in opposition to this amendment. The uh, gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it was a fascinating colloquy that we had, um, and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle said that there was not sufficient notice given from the majority on the text of this legislation or the text of this amendment. However, we have before us a second degree amendment to my amendment that was prepared ahead of time. It is not handwritten. It is typed out. It is thought out, apparently. I would say that that says to me that you simply don't like the original amendment, and this would mean that there was plenty of time to review whether or not the, the, our amendment was uh, appropriate in terms of uh, language, in terms of uh, legality and those questions. But the gentleman goes just for 15 seconds. Have, sure. It's just, it's, it's the, the, as, as all staff do, uh, we, all, we both have excellent staff. They, 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 they worked very rapidly on the most urgent parts of it. And um, there's still, that doesn't mean that there's still, there's still not problems. It doesn't mean that it wasn't, didn't come in late. It's just that we have great staff. You have great staff, we have great staff. And they, they worked hard to do to deal those, with those issues they could in a short period of time, yielding back. Thank uh, I, I thank the ranking member. And I, I do agree, but the, our staffs are excellent. Um, the, the issue here, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, we just didn't have members getting in the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's okay. There's a good point about that, actually. <laughs> um, there's an easy way to find that out. You just ask them, right? They tell you that. Um, <laughs> So I, I, then I would say that this, this, then I would say that our language, is, we we vetted it, you know, spent a significant amount of time making sure it's right and perfecting it, and I think this uh, amendment uh, weakens it in a very large way. Presidential records are not determined by the person who created them; they're uh, they're uh, determined by a, a process that's been established for. Uh, you know, almost 40 years now, uh, about what is official business and what must be disclosed. This simply, uh, my amendment simply closes a loophole 
that is there for Republican or Democrat administrations. Now, I have restrained from talking about this White House and their policies on uh, uh, email accounts. But I can quote Henry Waxman for a period of two years about the Bush administration, and I would be happy to do that. Um, regarding uh, on April 16 of 2008, Henry Waxman said, then uh, chairman of uh, this committee, too often over the past several years, our investigations have revealed weaknesses in government preservation of email that could leave substantial gaps as future historians examine White House and agency decision making." End quote. Another uh, same statement uh, from uh, Chairman Waxman, as more and more official business is conducted over email, these records must be preserved as a vital part of our history. Um, and his legislation, he outlines, ensures that email records are properly preserved. That is what this is about. This doesn't say that as, a, um, as an individual working for the President that you can't have uh, a Gmail account at home. It just simply means you cannot transact official business over that email account. This closes a loophole. I would, I would uh, ask the committee to reject the second degree amendment go with the initial language that we have crafted and move forward on, on a, on a the gentleman yield? I would be happy to yield to the chairman. Uh, I agree with the gentleman that the second degree amendment appears to be flawed in three specific ways that I can pick out quickly, even before my staff grabs it. One is that it doesn't define emergency or who would declare that emergency. Two, it doesn't have a reporting requirement that that emergency uh, and thus uh, you know, the, this private use has occurred. And three, it doesn't have any determination of how one would then capture, as required in the, in the base statute, uh, that information. Uh, and for that reason, I also will oppose the second degree amendment. Yield and back. The gentleman yield, I, the gentleman I yield the further. Chairman, if I could finish with one final quote. Um, I ask him now his consent. The gentleman have an additional two minutes without objection. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Uh, on February 26th, uh, uh, in an oversight uh, hearing here in this room, Chairman Waxman said, the White House has an obligation to have the official business of the White House on emails that are preserved, and they need to be preserved whether they are on one account or another. It was brought, it was brought out at this time that uh, former, uh, one of uh, President Bush's chief advisors uh, sent out uh, about 140,000 emails over his RNC account. There was outrage on the other side of the aisle, and many of us thought that was a, a breach of presidential records. And so, um, you know, I, I think what this amendment does is take it out of the partisan realm, solidify what is and what is not appropriate. And with that, I would be happy to yield to the uh, uh, bill's sponsor or the, the ranking member. I know they. Was it the ranking member? If you would like me to yield, I would be happy to yield for question and comment. I will. I will, I will I, the, again, the, the very things that the Chairman just pointed out um, are the very reasons why when you, we get something late, it, it, it makes it kind of difficult. Um, <laughs> no, I am serious. I understand. I understand. And I think this is something that we can work out. And uh, I know Mr. Towns had asked you to yield to him, but I would hope that we could work this out because, again, I think we have been showing uh, a lot of good faith bipartisanship here. And I think the, but these, these are legitimate concerns. And I mean, we could go like, on this discussion like a ping pong ball, um, because no matter what we present, there are still going to be some issues, because we are dealing with a very, a very sticky kind of situation here. Um, but uh, but uh, so I, I think Mr. Towns wanted you to yield to him. You said exactly, I'd be happy to yield. You said exactly what I was going to say, so therefore I yield back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Ms. Norton, I'd be happy to yield to my colleague. And I, I think Ms. Norton wants you to yield to her, too, by the way. Yeah. I want to strike the last word. Let, 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 me, let me indicate what my. The gentlelady is recognized because the gentleman's time had long expired. <laughs> I, I, thank, I want to strike the last word. Just, uh, I, I appreciate what Mr. McHenry is doing. You notice at one point he indicated that, that the Bush administration had established a firewall. Uh, with, uh, that, that was effective with respect to some communications. Let me tell you the problem I have that I think, that, that I think could, be, 
cleared, could, could be fixed. Where we are dealing with clear-cut matters, uh, there is no problem. The problem, as we who sit in this House understand, is the overlap often between an official and a non-official communication. Now, if you are in the House and you have any doubt, there is some place to turn to. You can call the Ethics Committee. There's some, there is a fulcrum that can give you some idea. You can even ask for a written opinion. Uh, I don't know uh, that this amendment requires the administration to itself issue guidelines and regulations so that, in fact, there would be some standard. Uh, since I'm not sure who you'd go to to find out if you had a question, uh, when we have those very same questions here, we do have some place to go. If each administration had to establish a set of, of its own guidelines, since there's no regulatory body, there's no, nothing like the Ethics Committee, then, in fact, the problem about and I think the only problem is what's official and what's non-official. I agree with Mr. McHenry. You ought to know the difference between all of us have a Twitter, Twitter accounts, which are unofficial, and we have Twitter accounts that are official. But the overlap between what is an official, and I think Mr. Towns' example went to that, might lead somebody in the White House who, let's say, is, is, is a staff person to want to ask somebody or to have some standard by which to judge whether or not this falls under official or non-official. I think that if, there, if, if the administration, each administration were required uh, to itself promulgate a, a, a set of guidelines so that, uh, so that this overlap problem, which is more clearly the problem you are going to encounter, not the clear-cut problem, uh, could have some standard by which to judge one or the other, then I think Mr. McHenry's uh, amendment would go. My, my, would the gentlelady yield? I'd be glad to yield. To the I gentleman. think you hit on an extremely important point, and and I'd like to make sure that we do get input from the White House between now and the time this bill goes to the floor. And I know the uh, author would agree. What I would say, though, though, not to disagree with the lady, but to remind her that the jurisdiction of this legislation is that this belongs to the people. So, although I think it's important that the administration weigh in with these guidelines. If we assume that they can determine what information does or doesn't go to the people, then we have abrogated the basic uh, Mr. responsibility. Chairman, I, all I am trying to find is some standard by which a staffer who wants to know, as we have a standard, at least we have somebody to go to, is this official or non-official? If the administration has no duty uh, to have its own set of guidelines, we have jurisdiction. We could make, make sure that they submit those guidelines to us then they are left in a position that no member of the House is left. Well, will the gentlelady yield? I will yield in a second, because if I have a question, I will go to the Ethics Committee. And my question for Mr. McHenry, or, or for, for any of us, is who will the staffer go to here? And I am trying to search for some kind of standard, since I re recognize that, that the White House is different. Uh, and the thing that, that occurs to me is if, well, if each White House had to promulgate its own standards, it was you, Mr. McHenry, who said, that the White House had indeed erected a firewall in one in, in a particular situation, then there would be some accountability, there would be some standard. Otherwise, I can see a, I can see confusion arising as to what 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 is official and what is non-official. All I'm trying to do is to find a way so that one could, in good faith, try to ascertain either based on a piece of paper or if someone else has another suggestion. Uh, whether or not this uh, this this uh, uh, provision, which I don't think anyone can take exception to, in fact was being violated or not. Lady Yield, I'd be pleased. I just to have one question for Mr. McHenry. Uh, Mr. McHenry, would you agree that we do need um, an exception for emergency situations? I yield. I, I certainly appreciate it. I believe it is a loophole. And furthermore, being an Internet child, I mean, I have used, used the Internet and email in most of what I do to communicate, right? I would say that Washington existed and was able to communicate with one another before email. It is not the end of the world if you, don't, if you do not have access to email or electronic devices. 
so much as that would, it, it would, would upset my nieces and nephews and make them angry that I said that they could exist outside of a digital world, I think we could exist. The uh, uh, unanimous consent for um, I don't know where we are for a minute here. I think, I, I think, I think I'll, I'll take the liberty of uh, recognizing Mr. Clay, and he may yield to you for five minutes. The gentleman is recognized. Yes. First, uh, I'll yield to the gentleman. Thank you. I'll, I'll, choice. I'll take, take less than that. To the EC, the Internet Child, is he still there? <laughs> it's a new term, the EC. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, again, I think it, we're back to where we were before. Mr. Towns, again, graciously asked, you, you, you agree that an exception for emergencies, need to, we need to have that. I don't think we have that in what we have, all that we have discussed so far, I don't think we have that. Again, I would ask that we try to work this out. And, um, well, would, would it, my colleague, and I, I would yield, sorry, yield, I would yield okay. to the gentleman. I, I, I appreciate that. And, and likewise, with your concern that you received the, the R amendment yesterday, we only received your amendment this morning. So in terms of vetting it, it it's a two-way street. Right, and I, right. and I, I certainly understand that your second degree amendments um, in reaction to ours. I, I, it, and I would say this to my colleagues, who I have served w with you all since I have been here, um, Mr. Clay, Mr. Downs, uh, I mean, you have heard me before, right, uh, on financial services, right? I, I could have I um, raised my voice. I could have talked about President Obama. I could have talked about their policies. I didn't. I have restrained myself, and I am not trying to um, in any way harm this President. But if it were a Republican President, you would want us to accept this language. And it is all a matter of perspective of where we are. So if we could work out the language, I think it would be a wonderful thing. There is no need for us to, if we can work out the language, for us to even you know, have a vote on it. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't require that. I wouldn't request that if we could just work out something that is reasonable. Mr. And Chairman, that, happy Mr. Okay. Chairman, just re your time. reclaiming the time, let me, let me say that I support the amendment before us by Mr. Cummings, and I reluctantly oppose the amendment that my friend from North Carolina, the underlying amendment from, from the gentleman from North Carolina, because um, let me give you a hypothetical situation, a scenario. What if during an emergency, uh, all White House servers went down. Would all communications have to stop, or could staff use personal email until official systems are back online with the understanding uh, that what they put on their personal email accounts would have to be considered official record? I mean, and I don't think the underlying amendment actually explains it. Uh, would the gentleman yield? I do yield. Uh, now, this may just be a businessman trying to thread the needle, but a uh, former businessman, I guess I should say. The fact is, if all the servers went down and the President or the Vice President or the Chief of Staff at the White House or the General Counsel uh, said, use what you have to communicate, sure. at that moment, this bill in the Presidential Records Act does not de state that just because you have paid for an account that it can't be an official account. There is nothing in this, in this, uh, in Mr. Uh, 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 I'm, now I'm having a Rick Perry movement, McHenry's uh, uh, language that, uh, <laughs> thanks, Patrick, uh, that, uh, that says that it must be paid for by the government. So, as I said earlier when I was commenting on Mr. Cummings' second degree amendment, one of the challenges, if you have a formal out clause and you, you try to do it, is then you have to ask the question is, of the subsequent questions that uh, uh, Ms. Norton had, had referred to, you would have to have the rules related to how do you capture, what do you do, what do you designate. We believe the simplicity of the amendment as it is, is, one, it has no criminal or civil penalties. Two, it allows for a clear understanding that, quite frankly, if you, if you do official work on another account and it is reported, knowledge, et cetera, 
it's, it then becomes an official account, even if it's a Gmail account, a Twitter, a Facebook. If you do official work, then it is an official account and it is to be captured by the Presidential Records Act. It is one of the reasons that I think we are we're, we're trying to make perfect by over-describing the fact that if Mr. Towns uh, receives something from a Twitter account and it is clearly official, but it, he doesn't know it is an official account, he has an expectation that that Twitter account or that Facebook will be captured under the Presidential Records Act, and it would be the failure to capture it that would make it a, a misuse. Sure. And, and, Mr. Chairman, is that your understanding of the gentleman's amendment, that you can use Gmail, you can use personal accounts as long as you transfer the information into an official uh, Well, uh, if, uh, into the if, if the gentleman record. would yield, the term personal probably gives us all trouble. But there is no such thing as a government paid for Facebook account or a government paid for Twitter. Most of these things are free. Sure. So when you have the use of something free, you simply sign up. There is no prohibition. My own committee, our committee, we have, we can have dot-com events. We can actually post to something that is outside uh, the Congress, but it doesn't make it any less an official activity. So I think the gentleman's uh, attempt to perfect, although well-meaning, begs the whole question of what we're saying in, in reverse is if you, if anybody uses anything, whether it's paid for or not, whether it's a free Gmail, they, in fact, if they do official business, it must be captured as official business. Now, if they fail to capture, fail to disclose, and they're using a personal email to do back and forth communication to circumvent the Presidential Records Act, then it's a violation. That's all we're trying to achieve in this. I expect there to be a proliferation of accounts that we do not expect today. And the, the question is, are they official because they are paid for by the government? No, they are official and, because and, the President captures them on behalf of the American people. And, and, and just to respond to that, I have not seen any evidence of this administration trying to subvert uh, the, the, the open records. I, I haven't seen it. If, and if the gentleman fact, would yield, we are not making that claim. As a matter of fact, you might remember that under Mr. Waxman, he did not claim the president or the vice president was communicating uh, with the RNC and other areas. What he saw was individuals well subordinated within the White House, he believed, were engaging in communication that should have been captured. And if you remember, I think he issued a subpoena to the RNC for that purpose, to try to gather it. And he may or may not have been correct, but it is that exact kind of work, people who work for the president, that we want to make sure capture it. I have no doubt that the President and the Vice President can say nothing and do nothing that isn't public. It just, it just goes with being in that position. Okay. You. I, I have no further time to yield. Does anyone else seek recognition? Oh, I have a question. Uh, well, why the then gentleman is recognized for a question. Oh, since there is no sanction, why doesn't the amendment say you may not use the, uh, an official account for unofficial purposes without capturing it as an official, for, for, uh, as, as an official uh, matter? There is no sanction here. If the point is, as you say, and I agree, and the way you have expla ex explained it, why, and, and, and since the point is not to punish, but to make sure that if such an account is used in that way, including an emergency account, that it is captured uh, as an official account, why isn't the amendment stated in that way? I recognize myself for five minutes and yield to the gentleman from North Carolina to answer that question. I thank my colleague for asking the question. Um, because the, it, this is constructed in very similar language to the rest of the Presidential Records Act, and we wanted to be consistent with that. That is why we have amended the existing code in the way that we have, and it is proper in the, in the nature of the rest of the, the Act for it to be constructed this way. Furthermore, the explanation is very self-evident. You are not to use a personal account for official business a non-official account for uh, official business. It is a very basic thing. To my colleague from Missouri's question about what happens if we have this cataclysmic event where a server goes down, which apparently, I don't know if you all are on Verizon, 
But uh, I got the notice today the House network is running slow, and uh, I didn't receive email for about two hours. I lived. I survived. I had a nice breakfast. I was able to communicate with my staff. Um, you know, through Carrier Pigeon, through uh, enormous numbers of technological opportunities that we have, messenger service, um, bike messenger, we could go on and on. Anyway, uh, the point is, um, in the event of a cataclysmic event, you can then use your account and CC your official account, and it would be, it would be a, a presidential record, very clearly, very easily a presidential record, and that would be the way to get around that with surety and certainty that what you are doing is permissible and acceptable. Now, what became an issue, and the reason why uh, Chairman Waxman raised the question of the political accounts that the White House had, it wasn't a question of, of whether or not they could have a political account. The Bush administration used the same protocols that the Clinton administration did to provide for that, meaning, very simply, if you are doing that scheduling event that Ms. Norton mentioned and you are communicating about a, a fundraising event you should not be using under the Hatch Act and all this, there are designated officials that can have that communication on scheduling matters, similar to what we have as a matter of House rules. That is established. All that is done. It became an issue when you were using that political account to communicate with others and their official account about official business. Then you were going beyond what Chairman Waxman thought was permissible, and that became a presidential record when you are transacting official business. We want to make I, I thank easy. the gentleman for answering the question. And I, reclaim, I, I am is. reclaiming my time. I yield back my time. The question now occurs on the amendment to the amendment in the nature amendment the secondary amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute all those in favor signify by saying aye, aye. opposed aye. nay in the opinion of the chair it's the noes have it the noes have it the amendment is not agreed to the question now occurs on the amendment to the amendment in nature of a substitute offered by the gentleman from North Carolina all those in favor say aye aye opposed in the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, the amendment is agreed to. The question now occurs on the amendment. Hang on one second. There is no further discussion. The question is on the amendment in the nature of a substitute is amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. In the opinion of the, all those in opposed say no. No. You guys are actually for that. Okay. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, the amendment is agreed to. I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 3071 to the House with the recommendation that do pass as amended. The question is on reporting favorably H.R. 3071, the bill by the gentleman from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye, aye. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and uh, the ayes have it, and the motion agreed to, H.R. 3071 is ordered reported to the House. The committee will now consider H.R. 3433, the Grant Reform and New Trans uh, Transparency Grant Act uh, of 2011. I recognize myself for an opening statement. The consideration of the Grant Act today marks another important step of the committee's goal of creating a more transparent and accountable Federal government. The bill brings long overdue reform to the Federal grant-making process. From 1990 to 2010, Federal outlays for grants increased from 
$135 billion to more than $600 billion. Grants now consume nearly one-fifth of the entire Federal budget. In the opinion of the Chair, grants are often executive earmarks. Earmark reform took a long time to come to the House. It now begins to come to the executive branch. Tens of billions of, some, uh, tens of, billions of these sums go toward competitive grant programs as opposed to state block grants or formula grants. The dramatic increase in Federal grant spending has left taxpayer dollars vulnerable to waste, fraud, mismanagement, and abuse. Identifying and reducing these vulnerabilities in a, uh, in a, in, in a way in which the administration of grant programs has never been done before. Today, we are creating a law that gives the opportunity uh, for agencies why, why, sorry, laws created, I will start again, laws creating grant programs often give agencies wide latitude on how to choose uh, to distribute grant funds. The agency decision makers may have uh, virtually unilateral and unchecked discretion, while grant tours agencies often employ some form of competitive or more merit-based procedures in awarding grants, frequently the process is impenetrable and opaque. The bill lifts the veil of secrecy. An unsuccessful grant applicant may never learn why their proposed grant was not funded and why an agency made an award decision that did, that did so, uh, made an award decision that it did. Such decisions are often unexplained and undocumented, making it virtually impossible for the public, an auditor or an oversight body like ours, to determine whether the Federal grant award was based purely on merit or whether improper consideration came into play. This bill remedies that situation as well. I commend Mr. Lankford for introducing this legislation before us today, and I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I believe this legislation is well-intentioned, and I agree with its goals. As written, the legislation would increase transparency in the competitive grant selection process and would make several other positive changes to that process. For example, it would require agencies to post on the central website key information about grants they award, including grant agreements and criteria used to guide the selection of grant recipients and the numerical rankings assigned to grant applications. The bill would also enable grant applicants to request a debriefing from an agency if their applications are not chosen to receive funding. These provisions would help ensure that grant awards are made in a transparent manner and that applicants have made a clear understanding of the process. Uh, that said, while I am encouraged that the majority has so far worked on this bill in a bipartisan manner, I still have some concerns with the legislation as currently written, and I wish we uh, had taken the time to resolve these uh, matters before we brought this bill before the committee. For example, colleges and universities, which comprise a significant portion of the grant recipient community, have expressed a concern that if their entire grant applications are posted online, as would uh, be required by the bill, competing institutions will gain access to their proprietary information. I certainly share the goal of improving the transparency of the grants process, but believe we need to accomplish this objective in a way that appropriately protects the, the work products of researchers who are developing new ideas. Several members on our side of the aisle plan to offer perfecting amendments that would address this matter as well as a few other concerns I have with the legislation. Uh, if these amendments are adopted, I will support the legislation. However, if these amendments are not adopted, I will reluctantly oppose this bill. Mr. Chairman, again, I support the goals of the bill, but it is essential that we get the details right to ensure that the bill is implemented in a way that achieves our shared priorities. I would hope that uh, you will continue to work with me and the other members of the committee to improve the bill, and I would hope that uh, we will begin that process right now by adopting the amendments to be offered by Mr. Connolly and Mr. Murphy. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I will hold the record open until the end of the day for others who want to uh, insert into the record their opening statements. 
we will now open the bill h r thirty four thirty three for consideration without objection house resolution thirty four thirty three will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point the text has already been distributed and is in each of your folders the clerk will designate the bill h r thirty four thirty three a bill to amend title thirty one united states code to provide transparency and require certain standards in the award of federal grants and for other purposes i now recognize the author of the bill to make an opening statement thank you mr langford Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Grant Act being marked up today will improve the way Federal grant funds are spent. The bill focuses primarily on discretionary competitive grants, in other words, grants through which agencies quite literally transfer tax dollars at their discretion to the projects that the agency deems is deserving. The bill ensures that agencies that are authorized to do this have the basic procedures in place to ensure fairness in the process. The bill does not prescribe procedures that should be in place, but instead leaves that to each agency since each agency knows its programs and authorities best. The bill does, however, set out some basic elements that must be met. These procedures are necessary but not sufficient. They need to be followed, and agencies need to know if they, if they are following them, and they will be held accountable. Accountability and transparency are at the heart of this bill. This bill will require agencies to be more open about how they spend taxpayers' money when left to their discretion. This should not be a controversial idea. Grant applications who have invested time and energy in applying for a grant to further public purpose have a right to know that they have been treated fairly. Moreover, the public has a right to know that their money is being spent well. To that end, the bill requires agencies to post to a central government-wide website information about upcoming grant opportunities and about the outcome of every grant competition, to include the posting of successful grant proposals and the reasons supporting the selection of that su successful grantee. Upon completion of the, of the grant, the bill requires that the agencies post the final report or results of the grant for the benefit of future research in the American public. The bill adds two other measures to improve the grant-making process and pr promote transparency. First, the bill requires agencies to screen potential grantees and to make sure they have the necessary financial systems in place and are capable of, of actually performing the grant. There is no entitlement to a discretionary competitive grant. Screening out grantees that are not capable of carrying out the grant will reduce waste and unallowable uses, uh, usages of funds during the performance of the grant. Second, the bill promotes transparency and open decision making by providing disappointed applicants for grants that those grants are valued more than $100,000 with an opportunity for a debriefing in which the agency will inform the entity about why it made the decision and how they can then improve. The bill is designed to ensure that agencies have a fair and open process in spending grant funds. This should help all applicants for grants, but particularly those who may feel that, like the deck is stacked against them in favor of the big guys, a larger, better-known grantee, for example. Requiring the publication of a grant solicitation forecast, as it's called for in the bill, is designed to also help smaller grantees compete for grants. The more time a grantee has to decide if it should prepare a proposal, the better chance it will have to successfully compete. A smaller entity may have to choose between different projects or uses of limited resources. If a prospective grantee has an idea where an agency may be going months in advance, it will be better positioned to compete, even against a bigger grantee that may not need to make choices about where to focus, but because it has the resources to quickly put together proposals, and then it also relies on its own reputation. This bill covers a lot of ground, touching every, every Federal agency and grantees or potential grantees involved in a wide range of activities, from assisting vic victims of domestic violence to conducting cutting-edge research. We have attempted to craft the bill in a way that allows all agencies, regardless of their mission, to implement the measures without undue disruptions to their, to their operation. At the subcommittee hearing held in June, we received testimony from agencies such as GAO and OMB that have studied grant policy and looked at the need for reform from a broad government-wide perspective. In developing the bill, the committee staff has sought the input of numerous agencies, including OMB, DARPA, NIH, the National Science Foundation. The staff also met with representatives of the nation's leading university associations who represent the academic and research community. We work with these groups and will continue to do so to ensure this bill accomplishes its objectives and does not compromise academic freedom or do anything that would dampen the innovative research coming out of our country's excellent universities. I hope all members will support this bill before us today. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Anyone else seek recognition? The gentleman from Virginia is recognized to, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and let me uh, thank my colleague from Oklahoma, the chairman of the subcommittee in which I serve as ranking member, uh, and the majority staff, as well as minority staff, for uh, really uh, collaborating on this legislation as closely as we have. Unfortunately for us, I have to echo the, uh, the sentiments of the ranking member. Uh, the clock has just run out. 
the concern we have uh, about the bill is has to do with unintended consequences. I will have an amendment uh, that would address the one big concern we have heard from the research community. Um, and I understand uh, the intent of the gentleman from Oklahoma, and I am sympathetic with it. But I am also concerned about unintended consequences. I am concerned about the compromise of intellectual property. I am also concerned that with the best of intentions, we could end up imposing an unfunded mandate on the recipients of such grants, namely universities. Um, and so uh, I, I think we have to tread carefully here. I believe a little bit more time, frankly, Mr. Chairman, would allow us to have a unanimous vote on this bill. Um, and it would be most unfortunate if today, in the rush to get it done, especially if we are, as you suggested, perhaps going to have another markup, um, I believe we could use that time uh, wisely and productively uh, to have bipartisan compromise because we are almost there. Uh, but we do have this one sticking point that I think is um, not a trivial issue. It may be that our concerns can be satisfied. It may be that we could still craft language uh, working together uh, that would uh, meet the concerns at least halfway. Um, but I think the intent of the legislation is something we can get behind. Um, and I am hopeful, Mr. Chairman, that uh, you might consider delaying this markup uh, until our next session to give Mr. Lankford and myself and our respective staffs some time to address the concerns that we have heard. With the that gentleman yield? Yes, of course, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, I am going to see how far we get today, uh, first of all, because I think we can make progress through the amendment process. And I know there is at least one amendment uh, that between your amendment and a second degree amendment is going to be mutually acceptable. At least I have been informed by our much smarter than us staff that that is the case. Uh, but secondly, without taking exception to the claim that it is an unfunded mandate, one of the challenges we have is when we are giving people money, our core responsibility is to ensure that it is well spent. So that is one of the challenges where I have sympathy for those who say, it is going to cost me more to administer the money you are giving me, but I would take exception to calling it truly unfunded when, in fact, it is money. Uh, Mr. Chairman, reclaiming my time, I, I want to be very clear. Uh, everything I said was in the context of our concern that it could be unintentionally. Uh, nobody is questioning the motivation behind the bill because, in fact, I think we, we actually have common ground on the intent as the ranking member articulated and as you have just articulated. So uh, we are not trying to do that, but we want to reassure ourselves that we are, with the best of intentions, not doing that. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. If there is no further discussion, the bill is now open to amendment. Are there any amendments? No, wait a second. No, I apologize. Let me go back one. Does anyone else want to speak on the bill if there is no further discussion? Okay. Do it. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized to offer an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Amendment. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3433 offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. I thank the chair. And, Mr. Chairman, again, I want to uh, reiterate my appreciation to Mr. Lankford and the majority staff for, for their collaborative approach on this bill. We have substantially rewritten it uh, multiple times. Uh, working together since staff produced the first draft. Those changes reflect constructive feedback from stakeholders, including universities and federal agencies. Those changes avoid what could have otherwise been unintended negative consequences uh, of a well-intentioned piece of legislation. However, given the very rapid pace at which the spills come to the full committee markup, there is one major issue that we were not able to resolve in the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Just yesterday, my staff and staff from the committee discussed the legislation with representatives from the National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, and even DARPA. As you know, these agencies provide thousands of grants that have produced some of the most innovative breakthroughs in American technology. These agencies all requested that we change one provision in the Grant Act draft before us today, and I might add that was reiterated by the university community as well in our feedback, and replace the requirement that we post full grant applications with a requirement that grant abstracts be posted in its stead. The purpose of posting either the full grant application or an abstract is to help the public understand where Federal dollars are being invested. As NIH and NSF and others have noted, however, posting the full grant applications could have the unintended effect of allowing the theft of intellectual property. 
exposing national security information, or even adding hundreds of thousands of pages of paperwork to agencies already undergoing funding cuts. NIH and NSF noted that the average grant application is 15 pages, plus supplementary material, which can be much longer. NSF provides 7,000 grants per year, which means that requiring full posting of grants could create at least 105,000 pages of paperwork for NSF, not including supplements, uh, to, to process, post online, and make searchable. While this work would surely employ some Federal employees in, in my district, um, uh, it is not necessarily the best use of our Federal tax dollars. A greater problem than the paperwork, however, is the need to redact portions of the grant application that could expose individuals' intellectual property, consistent with provisions of the Freedom of Information Act. NIH has one FOIA lawyer who would be required to complete those redactions, an impossible task without hiring dozens more Federal lawyers. The alternative is to require universities to complete this paperwork, which would cons constitute um, possibly a massive unfunded mandate and an inexcusable burden at a time when State support for universities has created. To avoid both the paperwork expenses and the bureaucratic nightmare of redacting tens of thousands of pages of grant materials, I have drafted this amendment, which would require posting grant abstracts rather than the full grant information. This would still protect the public interest by requiring agencies to explain how they are using taxpayer money but would do so in a way that takes, uh, takes cognizance of the concerns I have raised. My staff and I have been in discussions with the subcommittee chairman and his staff since yesterday about this amendment, and I hope it is seen as a friendly one. I believe if we can resolve this issue, we can have a, a unanimous uh, vote in this committee for this piece of legislation. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. I recognize myself in opposition to this uh, amendment. Uh, I think it guts the core provision here. Uh, I do agree that redaction uh, of proprietary information and classified information is uh, essential, but I disagree with the gentleman's amendment in two ways. First of all, the assumption is that every single page and every single addendum is already reviewed as part of the grant process. Uh, all, too, all too often, this committee has found that people sign things, as they did in the case of Mineral Management Service. They sign a cover page never having read it, so their initials are on something and it means nothing. If, if, if they are not currently reading and evaluating all the grant requests in the totality, then shame on them and shame on them on behalf of the taxpayers. However, I do sympathize that redaction is a separate question, uh, and no better organization to propose in electronic format those items which are proprietary, which would not be releasable by FOIA, than the grant applicant. In so doing, the grant applicant, in fact, dramatically reduces the time necessary for uh, evaluating whether or not those requests for redaction are appropriate. And we certainly understand Social Security numbers, individual identity, home addresses, and other information of that sort are commonly redacted, and you must read the entire uh, text in order to find all of those. So I do believe that there is a hand and glove relationship that has to exist that will m mitigate most, if not all, of that. Having said that, I know the author of the bill is perfectly willing to work in any way, shape, or form to ensure that that be further streamlined in the process. And if it is not agreed to today, certainly I am willing to have a manager's amendment that further clarifies that when we go to the floor. And with that, I yield to uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma, the author of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, this is well thought through, and this is something we have been in conversation with, uh, with the gentleman from Virginia and I have. Uh, it is very important that we do protect intellectual property rights. Uh, it is very important that we don't put out trade secrets or something that can be patented and it is stolen in advance by someone else that gets it by going online and gathering that information. Uh, I do understand that that has been a part of the ongoing conversation as, as we have walked through this process. We want to be careful to do that. That is why we made a change in the bill adding the section that is on page 11 beginning on line 18 that allows that e exception so that any agency head, when notified, and we are talking about adding a checkbox on the application to say this has proprietary information in it, I would like for this not to be posted online, that agency head then can then give authority to anyone within his agency to say if this is checked, then only the abstract is posted, which is what uh, the gentleman from Virginia is requesting on this, that only the abstract would be uh, posted. We want the default to be that the full piece is posted, 
And uh, we are not talking about printing out the documents. And I know that Mr. Connolly was talking about printing out the documents. We are talking about just posting online on a website. So it doesn't increase the amount of paper being produced here. It is just the production of a PDF that may go out on a website. Uh, but this allows that uh, exception to go out and say if this has proprietary information, it does not go public. Only the abstract is posted there. Uh, so that is a request that the applicant can make on it. That is something an agency head can look at. There is also the exemptions for FOIA that are built into this. The reason we felt like it was very important to get this out is we want the final winning application to be seen so smaller grant requesters that do not have large grant staffs can look and learn through the process. We are perpetually excluding people in small towns, in smaller universities, because they do not have the large grant writing staff. We want them to see multiple winning pieces that they can then evaluate and be able to step would, in. And would say, the gentleman yield? Actually, it is the Chairman's time on it. So I, I would yield back to the Chairman now. Uh, reclaiming my time, uh, and I, I, I think as before I yield, that what you see is the, is the kernel of the most important part, that universities who prevail, who are generally the ones who have told us, let's not change this, do have a form of proprietary information that will not be exempt. And that will be writing a really good grant, something that you pay grant writers to do. It is not the intention of this committee to have how you write a good grant remain a secret. Whether the grant's substance has merit is what we want to make sure that grantees ask for, but the style and the capability and what makes a good one should be a lesson that they want, all universities want all of us to have as a gift to society. And I yield to the gentleman from Virginia. I thank the Chair for yielding. Um, I, I would simply point out on the issue of redaction, I, I mean, uh, the goal you are setting, we don't disagree with. But I, am, I, I remain concerned about unintended consequences. When you are asking, I, I cited one agency that gives 7,000 grants a year. That doesn't include the number of applications that are failing that don't make the grade. The idea that they are going to go now go through and redact sensitive or intellectual property issues in every single one of those grant awards and possibly applications as well, I think is, is not a trivial issue. And, and that is one of the concerns we have got. Now, if they delegate that responsibility to universities, for example, uh, then that puts the unfunded mandate on the universities, which is of concern to me and I know my colleagues as well. That is the nature of our concern. If we can, my amendment is designed to try to do that. If there is a better way to do it, we are certainly open to it. Uh, simple rejection of the concern we are putting on the table isn't going to get us a bipartisan bill. Reclaiming my time, uh, which has really expired, uh, I, I do want to remind the gentleman uh, that, as I previously said, that, in fact, a university, an applicant, must by definition know what is sensitive. So it is not a burden to say, tell us what is sensitive uh, at all. And as the gentleman from Oklahoma already said, clearly, uh, the, it is only the prevailing grants that become public, so this, this requirement occurs only for those who succeed. The rest uh, retain their proprietary information by a, a, an absence of, of disclosure. Mr. Chairman, Does anyone else seem? Would, would the Chairman yield for one moment as well? Just, uh, my, t my time has expired. Would you seek recognition? Yes, sir, I would. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. The, the, the one comment that I would make with this as well is it, it, the redaction is not what is required on it every time. The FOIA request, then go back and redact things that are FOIA. The agency head can go the abstract completely. And so the request that this amendment makes is currently in the bill. It just changed the default, from the default being that the abstract is always up and people don't get the full application. This changes the, the application being the default. And if they request it, then it goes to the abstract. So it is not just a matter of they have to go through and be a FOIA expert to figure out what is in and what is out. They just request this has proprietary information and I would like you to go to abstract. If the agency ahead agrees, yes, it goes to abstract completely. And so it, it, on the issue of you have to have FOIA experts everywhere, I don't, I don't agree with that. Uh, what we have to have is someone that is writing the grant that has an information and a head to be able to know, which is obviously what they are doing. They understand this is a significant piece. And if it goes forward and gets public, then this is a problem. So this allows that, but it just puts the default. Rather than the exception running the rule, this puts the rule running the rule. Most applications are not going to be sensitive. Most applications can be out there. Those that are the exception should then have the possibility to go to an abstract, and this is what it allows. I, I would, Mr. Chairman? It's my time, actually, and yes, I would yield. Okay. Uh, just one point. It, that is not the t that's not the information we got yesterday from the granting organizations. In fact, quite the opposite. They said most applications, in fact, include sensitive material. 
right, just, you know, reclaiming my time, just based on obviously who you ask and the grants that are coming through. If you're, if you're competing for a water grant in a rural water district, uh, that may be a completely different issue uh, than if you're competing for a grant for a scientific research. Uh, so depending on the agency, obviously some agencies are going to run a lot more sensitive uh, information. They're also going to be up to speed on what's sensitive and what's not sensitive at that point. All I'm looking for is the default measure to be this. It gives full latitude to the agencies to be able to come back and say it goes to completely uh, to what you're requesting on that and it is a simple form. So I don't see it as an unfunded mandate, again, for two reasons. One is they're requesting money from the Federal Government for the general uh, benefit of all Americans. Uh, but the, the second part of it is, is that they already have that information. The grantee uh, can just request it in their application process. And with that, I would yield back. The gentleman yields back. If there are no further questions, the question now occurs on the amendment from the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. All of those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Nay. In the opinion of the Chair, the nays have it, the nays have it, the amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Mr. Chairman, the Ranking Member is recognized for a purpose of an amendment. Mr. Chairman, I uh, have an amendment uh, that is being uh, sponsored by Mr. Murphy. Uh, the Clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3433 offered by Mr. Cummings of Maryland. All right. Very well. The gentleman is recognized to speak on the amendment on behalf of himself and Mr. And Murphy. Mr. Murphy, yes. Mr. Murphy was unable to be here. Uh, but this amendment would eliminate the bill's requirement that agencies disclose the names of individuals who uh, peer review individuals who, of individuals who peer review grants. Uh, the underlying legislation requires agencies to, dis to disclose the identity of peer reviewers to the general public. Uh, while this provision is intended to expand transparency and eliminate potential um, conflicts of interest, it would create substantial problems for grant awarding agencies. Most importantly, requiring that the names of peer reviewers be made public will likely limit the ability of the grant awarding agencies to recruit, recruit qualified uh, peer reviewers. <clears throat> These reviewers are generally volunteers who review grant app applications in their personal time. If their identities are revealed, these individuals may face backlash from individuals and institutions whom they did not select to receive an award. Additionally, there is a danger that peer reviewers uh, who know that their identities will be revealed may have difficulty remaining impartial for fear of offending a particular applicant. Uh, after initial conversations with several scientific agencies and other stakeholders, we found that the concerns with the peer review pro provision as written are widespread. These concerns must be taken seriously. Uh, and I can say, as uh, one who represents um, Johns Hopkins uh, and the University of Maryland, talk talking to their folks, they, they definitely agree with this amendment. 